In this episode, we're talking about milling off-axis features on a three-axis CNC. So whether you call it a jig or a fixture, it can be a real pain in the ass. Stick around. Today we're talking about design, good design, the kind that doesn't follow rules, the kind that transcends geometric simplicity, yielding aesthetic symmetry, the kind that keeps engineers up late at night designing fixtures. So here we are, you're getting better with 3D modeling tools, getting fancy with sketch planes, maybe doing a little surface modeling, things are looking cool, ergonomics are improving, and you're starting to incorporate some off-axis elements into your design. You 3D print a couple prototypes, no problem, looks great. Hey, let's mill one out of wood. And here's where things go sideways. You're faced with the challenge of creating something on a three axis machine that was designed for, well, style. That's a typical dilemma, right? Uh, figure out how to fixture something that wasn't meant to be held by a vice. For the hobbyist, it's not impossible. And today I'm gonna walk you through the process of fixturing and milling off axis ports in the Arcator 3 handheld. It's actually easier than you think. Looking at the Arcator body that we milled out in a two sided operation, it was easy because we created a fixture to hold the stock in place for us. Just a simple pocket jig because that's all we needed. In this case, things are a little more complex and we need to hold the body in several different angles. If you recall though, I designed the body by modeling the negative space, which in this case would be the perfect fit to interface with this shell of a body. So let's start with the thought that the modeled negative space can help us to hold the otherwise rounded object. With a few tweaks, the model of the negative space can be used as a body interface with room for some additional mounts. But how do we need to hold this part for milling? Let's consider the symmetrical shape of the object and determine what features need to be milled. We have shoulder buttonholes, which are perpendicular to the shoulder faces. We have rear ports, which again have access perpendicular to the rear face. And lastly, we have a power switch, which is similar to the shoulder buttons, but located on the front right cheek of the body, if you will. Although these are all different angles, fortunately they're all parallel to the face mainly because all these ports integrate with components which are mounted on the circuit board, which, by the way, is also parallel to the face. So this isn't so bad. Basically, if we can hold the body, which we know we can, all we need to do is to accommodate some very specific angles to mill each of the ports. Of course, while clearing the CNC gantry and remaining parallel to the spindle and all those orientations. To do this, using a modified body interface, I first created a sketch to identify the center of rotation and the angles I'll need to accommodate. First thing to do is to find the center of the arcade or body. Next, I extended construction lines out from the shoulders to identify their angles. To define the necessary range of motion, I drew an ellipse from the center of the rotation that was tangent to both of those shoulder planes. Turns out the shoulders will require a plus and minus 23.7 degree rotation to position the body on the spindle's axis. I added points where the planes were tangent to the ellipse. These represent the work coordinate system zero for the body when it's rotated which will be used when generating the milling operations. They're really all the same point, only at different degrees of rotation along the ellipse. So when using the jig, I'll set the work coordinate system zero in the centered position, and all other off-axis angles will share the same exact work coordinate system zero. The only challenge is that the center work coordinate system is floating in midair, in this case, 9.5 millimeters off the top of the body. But we'll come back to that. Next, I added some arch slots to limit the jig's range of motion. For hardware, I plan to use an M5 bolt at the center of rotation and two M5 thumb screws to lock the fixture at specific angles. Last thing to do is to define the base height necessary to support the rotation circumference. I drew that up, extruded the base, and gave it some mount holes, and then finished up the body interface so I can remove it a little easier. With that, the jig design is complete. Although this fixture could have been milled, it's easy enough just to 3D print the parts. But because the plastic is thin and light, be sure to print them with the rigid material and the high density infill to minimize any mechanical resonance. The parts were exported and sliced in Simplify 3D, then printed on the TAS. With the completed parts, I took them over to the bench to place the threaded brass inserts and assemble the jig. With the fixture complete, we're finally ready to mill the off-axis ports on the CNC. The jig is mounted to the work table and squared to the gantry. Locked and loaded with a 1 16th inch two flute flat end mill, we're ready to rock and roll. But first, back in Fusion 360, let's generate the operations. To do that, we'll need multiple setups as each one defines the stock, its orientation, and work coordinate system zero. And we know that's going to change at every angle. The sketch points we added earlier will be helpful and serve as a reference for the setup to know where each orientation zero is located. 
For each setup, we define the x and z axis, as well as the work coordinate zero using those points again. Once you've done that, we add a simple 2D pocket operation and select the specific ports to be milled. With the operations set up, I post-process them to a network drive, then head back over to the mill. First thing to do is set the centered work coordinate system zero. This one's 9.5 millimeters above the center of the body face. And side note, although I could have added detents to the jig to help find the specific angles, this time around I'll use a float level to determine when the body is parallel to the x-axis. Of course, this only works if your machine is properly leveled. With the zero set, I load up and run each of the off-axis toolpaths, being careful that the body is in the correct orientation for each step. With the milling complete, I removed any remaining tool marks and lightly sanded the body. Now at this point, I'm going to call this a success. Before you get too excited though, it's important to note that this process will expose how well your machines are tuned and if they're all calibrated and trammed properly. There are lots of chances for things to go wrong here. The 3D printer may not produce an exact fit if its calibration is off a little. It may not be rigid enough if the slicer settings are wrong. If your CNC isn't square, the milling locations will be off for the various operations. Anyway, you get the idea. I've used this technique several times now and conversely if you take your time, measure twice and have a little luck, this technique can work great for you as well. In the end, I'm just kidding. It's not that hard. Give it a try and you have some fun. Just don't complain if you cut some corners and it doesn't work for you. It's definitely a mixed media learning adventure that can yield great results. So that's going to do it for this video. Hopefully this was helpful or at least gave you some ideas about dealing with complicated and challenging jig fixtures or at least demonstrates how 3D printers can be used to make finely crafted products. <laughs> Before we end this video, I'd like to take time to thank the people that support this channel. Now, I don't have a long list, but I do have a few dedicated folks that regularly contribute. Of course, the content takes time, the material costs money, but your contributions make it easier. Whether you're buying through an affiliate link, Patreon, or direct donations through DIY.engineering, I just want to say thank you. You make it all possible. That said, we have some great projects coming up, and if you're not a subscriber, what the heck are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button, ring the notification bell, it'll keep you in the loop on future videos. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up to let them know that you like this stuff. That's kind of how the system works. To join the conversation, visit social.diy.engineering, or just leave a comment below, it's all good. In the meantime, that's it and that's all, so be safe out there, have fun, and I can't wait to see you next time. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you like the video, please subscribe to the channel. It's how we're building the community. Also, allow me to bring better content. Also, check me out on these other social networks. There's lots of cool stuff there, too. I know you're gonna dig this.